to talk. In this new series, I guess you'll see what is pretty much the mixture as before. Some consumer motoring, some road tests, obviously, some road safety items, a look at some components. If you're not used to talk, in other words, if you're new to it, that's what it's about. I guess there will be, for this program, a, a general overriding philosophy that concerns itself with economy. Economy generally, but more specifically, the economy of fuel conservation, which has become, of course, very important to us. You might like to subtitle it, Motoring for the 1980s. To begin the series, we've chosen Holden's VC series Commodore. The Commodore has been on the market in Australia now for over 18 months. This is the very first facelifted version, and it varies very little. It's slightly different on the external appearance, but some fairly significant mechanical changes which we'll deal with in the very near future. Just now, we're at Lang Lang, General Motors Holden's proving ground, not far from Melbourne. What better place to test a car which was developed on this very area? And we are on a high-speed, constant-speed loop. Hence, I'm just going round and round. So much constant speed, in fact, that it's possible to drive on this loop without having to steer the car, because the speed itself will hold the groove. By the same token, it doesn't achieve very much, so perhaps we should go and do something more important. When the Commodore was first released on the Australian market, it really did cause a bit of a stir. Here was, perhaps, the first all-Australian constructed motor car with the sort of features that people have been waiting for for years, with compactness, with efficiency, with a number of inbuilt safety features, and at the price that most people could afford to buy. Something with a great deal of appeal, and General Motors, of course, were immediately laughing because they'd scooped the pool. The Commodore uses a revised form of Holden's radial-tuned suspension in an attempt to provide the best mixture of handling and ride. Handling, incidentally, is a combination of factors which includes road-holding and steering response. And Holden's used to be infamous for their rolly, slushy understeer, but no more. Handling also includes the degree of body roll, pitch and sway. The right combination of all these contributes very greatly to your safety. And in all these areas, the Commodore is really very good. It's also worth noting that even at speed, interior comfort levels and ride are both very acceptable. And that's something to keep in mind for long trips because it means less fatigue for driver and passengers. But over 100 kilometres per hour or so, there is some irritating wind noise. Time for us to try the brakes, another area in which General Motors were never very good. Now that's really good, and that's what I like to see, actually. There's, uh, that's a maximum effort stop with no lock-up at all, which is great. It means that despite the fact that we have a balance of disc and drums, that they really are well set up and they stop extremely well. The point is, I also happen to know that they go on stopping well as well. So, nice move for General Motors, good stoppers. Incidentally, could I please ask that you don't all write letters saying that nobody ever drives the way we drive and therefore these tests are unrealistic. It's worth bearing in mind that it is necessary to do such things as stress testing, that is to take the car close to its ultimate limits. And that's what this is all about, and if we didn't do it that way, we wouldn't be able to get the information we really need to pass on to you. OK, now we're finished with bitumen. We'll take it on the dirt for a bit and see how it performs there. And I can tell you that probably the best feature of the Commodore is its suspension, which really is very good indeed. Under harsh acceleration, there's a slight amount of axle tramp on uphill inclines, but generally speaking, the coil spring rear end and the independent front suspension handle 
these sort of conditions very well. However, while they are doing so, one other small but significant feature rears its ugly head, and that is that for some reason or another, General Motors have not done a particularly good job with the gear shift mechanism in the Commodore, and it's a bit lumpy and a bit notchy and a little bit hard to use. And it is here, under these sort of conditions, where you have to shift gears quite often, that you begin to notice that it's not all that pleasant. And frankly, since it's only a sequence of linkages, it's not something that would be terribly hard to fix. And I would suggest that GM should take a look at it fairly soon, because these days, the ease of driving a car is one of the major points in selling it. Now that we're back in town and therefore back to the realities of normal day-to-day -day motoring, it's time for me to tell you that this particular Commodore is powered by the 2850 six-cylinder engine. Now it's also important to say that during the facelift, most of the changes that were made to the Commodore have been made to the engines, and they include such things as revised carburation, uh, new manifolding, inlet and exhaust, and high energy electronic ignition. And those things were done with the purpose in mind of improving performance, that is power output, and as well, giving greater economy. That sounds like a contradiction in fact, because it's often difficult to achieve both figures, but General Motors Holdens have achieved both better performance and better economy, and they claim somewhere between 7 and 15% improvement in economy and around 20% improvement in performance. That simply means that you'll get better economy than you had before, but in my opinion, it's still not good enough. I like the Commodore. I think it has the makings of a very good car. A couple of things to do though, and one in particular worries me. The 2.8 litre six cylinder engine in the Commodore is around 20 years old in its present form, and a good deal older than that as a design concept, and it's probably time for a complete new engine. Other people have made engines of the same sort of capacity, which are a great deal better in terms of both performance and economy. General Motors sticking with the old engine and progressively revising it year after year after year after year ultimately has its limitations. Let's look at a few facts. Even in its present revised form, this engine gives barely enough power. Certainly enough for normal motoring, but you'd need a little more if you wanted to overtake rapidly and sometimes a little more response for reasonable acceleration. And as well, I'm not sure about you, but I don't think that figures of 13 to 17 litres per 100 kilometres are enough in this day and age. And incidentally, that variation will depend on how you drive and what sort of configuration you build into this car. And if you're interested in the conversion, that's somewhere between 17 and 21 miles per gallon. Still not enough. OK, so what do we do? Build a new engine which gives all of those things more effectively. And if you think it can't be done, here's another 2.8 litre engine which does exactly that. This is the BMW 528i, and this also is a 2.8 litre engine. But there, any comparison between the BMW engine and the Holden Commodore engine ends abruptly. This engine is all alloy. It's also six cylinders, as it happens. It's overhead camshaft. It's cross-flowed. That is, the fuel goes in one side of the engine and out the other, and it's fuel injected. What's more significant, it develops very nearly 90% more horsepower, now called kilowatts, than the uh, Holden engine does, and something in the vicinity of 50% more torque in Newton meters. Thus, it's possible to build an engine which gives that sort of performance 
and keep it light, as you will with alloy, and give it performance and economy. Apart from that comment and the next one, I'm not about to do a complete comparison test between the BMW and the Commodore. That's not necessary. But it is necessary to say that this car gives in the vicinity of 23 miles per gallon or 13 litres per 100 kilometres consistently in town traffic conditions. And that's an improvement of about 20% over the figures that we were able to produce from the Commodore. Not only more power, but more efficiency as well. It seems strange, doesn't it, that one of the world's smallest car manufacturers can produce a six-cylinder engine that takes internal combustion engines of that configuration almost to their logical conclusion, whereas one of the world's largest car manufacturers has to persevere with an old hack that's been around for such a long time now that it's obviously due for replacement. That's enough of that. Let's think about the BMW in its own right. And obviously, uh, that sort of power from an engine in a car of this size immediately reveals itself as being an advantage. It's beautiful and it is beautifully controllable power because of the fuel injection that even at very light throttle openings you can just squeeze it away very delicately and it's very responsive. And that's the way power should be built into a car so that you can make use of it at very low engine revs or at very high engine revs. transmission is good. In this case the four-speed manual. There is a five-speed manual and there is an automatic version but it seems that the five-speed manual version is not available in Australia except a special order. So you're stuck with a four-speed or an auto and the four-speed manual is very good. It's, it's a very light shift, short throw. I'd like it probably be a little tiny bit longer than that. You don't have to reach down so far for it. A light clutch but uh, good transmission, well-selected ratios and very easy to use, and that's pretty important. Interesting point about uh, steering in this car, it has power steering, and I'm not sure that that's entirely necessary. There is some of the drain of the power of the engine being used to steer the car, where in with an alloy engine and with very light weights, it shouldn't be necessary. But there it is, you've got it, and it's good power steering, very good. It feels so good in town that I'm looking forward to the opportunity of doing some stress testing, so we might head out and try some of that. The BMW has four-wheel independent suspension, and it's under conditions like these, that is, very rough off-road conditions, that independent four-wheel suspension is supposed to work most effectively. And it certainly does in the case of this car, which handles such conditions very well. Bear in mind, it simply means that each of the individual rear axles are working independently of one another and moving up and down according to the bumps and the dips without necessarily moving the body of the car around too much. And for that reason, there is a higher degree of comfort, but not only that, but each wheel being on the ground at all times means you get better traction and therefore better controllability under these conditions. Therefore, the BMW is a good off-road car. There's no two ways about it. An interesting point arises from that drive on the dirt, which reveals itself again in some circumstances on a bitumen surface. This car has a lot of power and a relatively soft independent rear suspension and as such it needs a limited slip differential. Just let me explain. In a normal situation when the inside rear wheel spins, the outside wheel is not gripping or at least it's not driving, which is more the point. 
a limited slip differential allows some of that slip to go on, but at the same time, the second wheel to continue to drive. Because of the setup of this car, that wheel spins excessively under certain load conditions, and it needs to have a limited slip differential. Let me describe to you a situation in which that would be graphically illustrated. In a parking station with those long uphill spiralling curves, there are times when the BMW won't pull up out of some of those parking station situations. That's embarrassing. So, uh, although not all cars need limited slip diffs, this one does. It should be fitted as standard equipment. All right, getting on from there, however, in every other respect, the handling of the BMW is excellent, to say the very least. The combination of steering geometry, suspension design, the weight and the balance of the car are great. It is very sure-footed indeed. It handles and it points excellently and at the same time, as a result, provides a very high degree of primary safety and driver responsiveness, which makes it a pleasure to drive reasonably briskly. OK, now let's try the BMW's brakes. The classic German four-wheel disc brake system, you'd expect it to work well, and it obviously does. There's no question about it. Uh, Mercedes, Porsche, BMW, even Volkswagen to a lesser extent, do brakes very well, and the BMW is certainly no exception. We should take a brief look at the comfort and facilities, and for starters, this is a nice little touch that you don't see too much anymore. And perhaps we could. It's not all that expensive, in fact, to do that sort of thing, and a set of tools is valuable and important. The boot space is excellent in this car, but it is so at the expense of something else. When you probe deep inside the rear passenger compartment of a car to provide additional boot space, you've got to lose something. And in this case, what you're losing is rear leg room and a certain amount of rear headroom as far as getting in and out is concerned as well. Now that is a bit of a problem, obviously, and in that sense, the BMW is not quite so package efficient as a lot of other European cars are. Front seats of the BMW are very comfortable for both the driver and the passenger. But one point occurs to me, and that is that if you're over six feet tall, and if most of your length is in your legs, you might have a bit of a problem. This steering column is adjustable telescopically that way, and even up as far as it will go. When you lift your foot to put it on the clutch, it just about touches the steering column. Now that's at my height. If you're taller than I am, and as I say, if that length is in your legs, you could have trouble getting your feet between the pedals and the steering column. That seems to present some difficulties as well. Other than that, it's very good inside, it's very well appointed, very comfortable, very efficient, as German cars tend to be. The BMW 528i costs just a little over $28,000 in Australia, and it provides almost all of those luxury features that you would find in a top luxury car anywhere in the world. And for that money, so it ought to. But the price is not so much BMW's fault as the fault of a government system which provides protection for an Australian manufacturing industry which can't produce anything quite as good, remarkably enough. Getting back to the Commodore for a moment, that Commodore which we tested costs around $7,000, substantially less obviously, but if you wanted to fit to the Commodore the performance and the efficiency and all of those luxuries which are standard equipment on the BMW, then you'd have to buy the top of the range Commodore SLE with a V8 engine, which provides even less economy, and then it would cost around $12,000. Okay, significantly, the 528i BMW in Germany, the country of its origin, costs around $14,000. Thus, the figures come quite close together. The point being that if you can build a car like this in Germany for $14,000, you ought to be able to build a car like this in Australia for $14,000. Maybe the time will come.
One of the interesting spin-offs of our liquid fuels problem has been the emergence of a number of so-called fuel-saving devices. And for the most part, these fuel-saving devices have been on the market for some considerable time, but only recently have they been heavily promoted for obvious reasons. As a friend of mine pointed out recently, if you used all of them and you were able to achieve the fuel saving that they suggest you can achieve, then you would actually be making fuel in the tank. We elected to use five of these things as a test procedure, all of which perform entirely different functions. Now, we started, for example, with what's called MSD, that is multiple spark distributor, meaning of course just that, more than one spark, but of a much higher intensity and with a deeper spark throw. And as well, a little item called Miles Master, which is supposedly in there to regulate the pressure of fuel to the carburetor from something like seven pounds down to three and a half pounds, the intention being that that should make a difference because it won't be flooding carburetors and you won't be using more fuel than you need to. A number of others which we'll come to in a moment, but importantly, we need to establish a test procedure. Now, the Australian Standards Association have laid down a test procedure for economy checks on cars, and it is very complicated, and it may well, in fact, there's no question that it does work, but it's not realistic in the terms of the way in which you and I would use a car, because the way we do a, a fuel check is simply to drive the car on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the way we decided to do this. But before we could do that, we had to establish that the car achieved certain miles per gallon or litres per 100 kilometres to begin with, and that it was in absolutely standard factory trim. So we went through the procedure of tuning carefully, and then we established what its base miles per gallon figure was, and we started doing some testing. Now, importantly, you don't just test over 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 kilometres. You test for a matter of a week minimum and preferably even longer than that. So in each case, there was a seven-day procedure involved minimum, and the temperatures during the day were roughly the same. It was all done during the summer months. The method of driving, of course, varies only in the basis that it does for all of us on a day-to-day -day basis. And in every case, all of the tests were done just in the city and suburbs. No highway driving at all. The results of the MSD and Miles Master were disappointing, to say the least, in that I was able to achieve absolutely nothing. The figures were exactly the same with or without either of those two items fitted. But, undaunted, we pressed on. And the next two items were this, which is called APO water vapour injector, that is water and alcohol as it just so happens, a mixture of the two things. Once again, all sorts of claims made for it, but one of which is that it improves combustion efficiency and thus fuel economy. And the second item is a variation on the air cleaner theme, just simply a, a different type of air cleaner, which is again designed to improve the flow of air through the carburetor, through the induction system generally, and to give you better fuel economy. So now we try them. I would really like to be able to tell you that the APO and the Unifilter worked, but they didn't. We achieved absolutely no result with either of those either in terms of fuel economy improvement. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that those four products all make claims other than just for improvements in fuel economy, and we haven't attempted to test those claims, and it may well be that you could get some benefits in those areas. But I seriously doubt that you'll get any benefit in terms of fuel economy, and it really is fairly obvious that you wouldn't. The car manufacturers, for all of their faults, are not complete fools. In this day and age, if there was anything available that really would give you a benefit, they'd build it into the car because they want to sell you more cars. Watch your money in that respect. There is one more product which we needed to take a look at that was available at the time. Castrol's friction modified GTX, which makes something similar of a claim in terms of fuel economy improvement and manages to achieve it, which is not surprising since Castrol is a very big company with a very big reputation. The improvement is in fact not great, but it does exist. And it may well be offset by the additional cost of the oil in the first place. But if you're a really patriotic citizen, you'll consider the fact that we need to conserve the fuel even if it does cost you a little more to do so. And therefore it might be worthwhile. And there are two other products which we will be looking at in the future, both called combustion improvers, which we have not yet completed, but which are definitely worth looking at, and we'll bring you the results of those as soon as it is possible to do so. 
Well, that's enough for tonight. In two weeks' time, we'll be taking a look at Chrysler's Valiant. And to complete our test of the big three next week, this XD Falcon. See now for the inventors as Stuart Wagstaff and the panel look at four more bright ideas that could affect our lifestyle in the new decade. And at 8.30, keep watching for that fine drama series, A Family Affair.